All right, Joshua chapter 3 and 4, lesson 68, there's lights, cross the Jordan. So, our last lesson we saw the spies go into the land, but the Israelites had actually not entered into the land of Canaan yet. Today, we'll see their entrance into the land of Canaan, and it's a beautiful uh, picture that it is. So Joshua chapter 3, we'll start reading here at verse 1. So everyone's got their Bibles out ready to go. Joshua chapter 3 at verse 1. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and re they removed from Shittim, and they came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests your Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. So, there's a few things here that are important for us to see. God is talking with Joshua. He is, as we said last time, the new leader of the Israelites. This will be the first miracle that God does now that Joshua is leader. And that miracle will be the parting of the waters of the Jordan River, as we'll see. Okay. So the Israelites are ready to cross the Jordan. They come, they travel a little bit, they come to Shittim, and then they come to the shore of the Jordan River, and they stay there for about three days, we read. Because the people need to get ready. One thing that the people must do is they must sanctify themselves, cleanse themselves. Before most of the formal, outward activities that were celebrations, like the Passover, the feasts, the people would cleanse themselves. They'd wash, not only physically wash themselves, which was a symbolic washing away of the sins, but they would offer sacrifices. They might abstain from some things. They might not do some certain things or have some certain foods to show that they were sacrificing themselves for the Lord. So they need to sanctify themselves before we go to church. Probably for most of you, Saturday night, mom and dad have you take a shower, get cleaned up, again, to physically wash. You're probably not thinking, this is a picture of the washing away of sins before I go to church. But you could. That's what the people are doing here. They're sanctifying themselves. Another reason they need to sanctify themselves is, typically, the people were not allowed to go by the ark. That was in the Holy of Holies. Only once a year could the high priest go in there. Okay? Now, because of travels and everything else, the Israelites would do that a little bit more frequently, but it was still kept in a probably holy way. This time it's going to be a little bit different. The priests are going to physically carry with those rods going through the holes or the loops in the ark. They're going to carry it into the waters. The people are going to pass by this ark as they go around it. In fact, God sets up, just like he did with the mount, Mount Sinai, no one could go up that mount. They had to put a fence around it so because it was a holy place. God also puts a buffer zone around here. He says them stay about 2,000 cubits, about 3,000 feet away. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty big space. That's more than half of a mile. That's how far they have to... So they can see it. They know what's going on, yet they can't get that close to it. Okay? So they need to sanctify themselves. So the priests are going to do that. And when the priests come to the edge of the water, God tells Joshua they're going to go in until their feet touch the water, and then the people will be ready to walk. Pass. Now we know from the story the waters are going to part there. Okay. So, again, some beautiful pictures here. 
The land that they're going to enter into, the land of Canaan, is a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the land that we hope to one day be in, heaven. The crossing of the Jordan River is a picture of going through death. We need to die to get to heaven. Okay? So that picture is there. There's the picture of the river being water, walking through of the washing away. Just like going through the Red Sea was a picture of baptism, so this is that. Okay? It's a way of salvation. It's also a picture of God forgiving their sins, making them clean from their sins. Okay? So all of these pictures were there for the people. In fact, in history, when we study groups like, say, the black slaves living in the South, okay, there's a famous song, Wade in the Water. God's going to trouble the waters and then it talks about going home. Because that's the picture. That's what those slaves wanted. They knew that their death would alleviate them from their slavery work and bring them into heaven. That's what they were singing about in the fields. So it's become a pretty well-known hymn, Wade in the Water. And that is what is being done here. So it's not just a symbol that is only for the Israelites, but it's a symbol that is for us as well. It's a picture of Going over into heaven, this idea of going through the Jordan River. All right, so what was the Jordan River like, though? What was it like to go through it? Okay. Uh, look at verse 12. Let's pick it up in chapter 3, verse 12. Now, therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribe of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon and heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, which is, bes which is beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. So let's take a look at the going over the Jordan. We read there that it overflew its banks. It was the time of the harvest. Some of you may have seen, uh, I don't think they're here, maybe they'll be at church tonight, but uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jen Van Baren, obviously she's, or Caleb and Jen Van Baren, she's from Colorado. Her parents are farmers, field farmers out there. They grow crops. And so I asked them on Sunday, how's the snowfall up in the mountains going for you this year? You might say, well, what does he care about the snowfall? Well, here, when farmers plant their fields, fields are watered by rain. God blesses the farmer by sending rain. And that's how the crops grow. You maybe see a field here or there that have some sprinkler systems in them, but we depend here upon the rain from God to water the plants. Where they are in Colorado, they don't get a lot of rain. In Loveland, Colorado. There's not a lot of rainfall like we get here. So the farmers there are dependent upon the winter snow. Those winter snows that fall and make not just three feet of snow, but 30, 40, 50 feet of snow up in the mountains up there, soon will begin to melt. And that snowfall that begins to melt comes down the rivers out of the mountains and through the rivers, and then 
the farmers, dependent upon how much snow is up there, there's people that measure it, and they tell the farmers, today you're allowed to pump 1,000 gallons, or however it may be. They have rules and regulations about how much water they are allowed to pump onto their fields. If there's lots of snow up in the mountains, they get to pump more if there's not so much. So they still are very much hoping to get a lot more snowstorms up there. And obviously the waters that come down through those mountains right now as they begin to melt will become not just nice little creeks and streams, but raging rivers, dangerous. In the summer you can go in and wade in them and play in them. Not right now. They are raging. The water is overflowing to the point that there's been times where the dams there have broken and come all the way down into Loveland and flooded parts of the city. So those waters are raging. They're coming down. They're overflowing their banks. And that's what we see here. We see that the Jordan River is overflowing its banks. It's much deeper and wider. We can imagine it's flowing more swiftly. It's a very strong current. Maybe you remember studying the people heading west. Play the game, the Oregon Trail. You've got to float your wagon across the river. Try to get your cows and your family across. It was very dangerous. There were times when it would tip over and capsize. That was what the Israelites are facing. The way that they were going to cross this river, you can imagine them for those three days while sitting there wondering what the Lord was going to do. Those who loved the Lord trusted in Him that He would somehow get them across safely. But many of them were still probably wondering, how are we going to cross this raging overflowing, huge river. Float. There's dangers involved. Maybe they thought, let's travel north and find a different spot to cross. But that's not the case. God was going to have them cross here, near the city of Jericho. And the way that the Lord did it is, He told the priests, when the priest walked forward, carrying that ark in their feet of all the priests, we can imagine four priests, maybe, one on each side of the ark corner, holding those sticks, the waters immediately not just right there, but way upstream, God built an invisible dam. Must have been a pretty amazing thing. And the waters began to pile up. So the waters coming out of the mountains, out of the high areas, coming out of the Sea of Galilee and traveling down the Jordan River, they stopped. They were being piled over there near a city. The rest of the water continued on its way down the Dead Sea. And again, not only was that miracle, but another miracle happened. We know that. Right now, you guys go outside, right? The snow is melting, and how is the ground? It's muddy. It's sticky. Does it dry up overnight? No. It takes days and weeks for it to dry up. It stays muddy and sticky. Well, you can imagine a raging river flowing through. That bottom would be even stickier and muddier. And yet, God says, the Bible says, these people crossed on dry land. God miraculously dried up the ground to make it very safe and easy for the Israelites to go right across with their families, their children, their wagons, their animals, all that they had were able to cross over, except for the two and a half tribes that stayed back. So, what did that invisible dam look like? That's always something I've been curious about. How, what did the people see there? Was it just a wall of blue water? Was there something, was it so far off they couldn't see it? We know that it would be 3,000 feet approximately far away from that ark, a half a mile on either side. They couldn't go next to it. So it's got to be a pretty wide area that they could cross. So the Israelites walk past the priests who are standing there waiting for the people. And once all of the people get to the other side, then those priests now can bring up the rear and follow all the way across the river. And we can imagine once their feet stepped out of the river, God released that dam of water so that it could begin to flow again. What that was like, it's a miracle. It would have been something to see, something awesome. No doubt in the people's mind that God was in control. Now what do they do? <coughs> Excuse me. That they get to the other side of the Jordan River. What are they going to do there? Joshua chapter 4. Let's take a look there. Verse 1, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place, wherein ye shall lodge this night. And Joshua called the twelve men who had, pre 
whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the covenant stood. They are there unto this day. Before the waters came crashing down, God had one more message for Joshua to do. Take you a man, one from each of the twelve tribes, and send them back into the riverbed, and have them pick up twelve large stones. Large, enough that they're easy to see. Large, probably pretty heavy for the men to carry, but not too heavy. And bring them over to the bank where now where all the people are residing, have them take 12 stones. And you, Joshua, take 12 other stones and put them on the other bank of the Jordan River, right where the priest first walked into the water, and set those 12 stones up in a pile. Imagine a teepee-like structure, a pyramid-like structure with these stones stacked up. Why? What are they there for? They are there for a memorial. For two reasons. Okay? Two reasons. One, that the people will never forget what God has done here. People will see those rocks and they will remember exactly what the Lord had done for them. But then also those rocks needed to be there for the children who would come, or grandchildren. So that as they were passing down the river, along the river, through the river, whatever it was, they would be passing through the spot and they would notice Father, mother, there's a pillar of rocks there. That's man-made. That didn't happen by accident. Why is that pillar of rocks there? Father and mother now have the responsibility to explain to their children. Son, daughter, that pillar is a picture of God's faithfulness to his people. Let me tell you about the time when the Israelites entered into this land and came across the Jordan River by a miracle. Let me tell you, child, about what pictures are there. About the salvation that that is a picture of. Of this land where our feet now stand in, in Canaan is a picture of heaven. And how passing through those waters is like the future pathway you and I will take when we die. Our deaths will come someday. And when we die, that will be our entryway into heaven. And so that is what these parents are supposed to point their children to. The wicked will see it. They'll either laugh at it, make fun of it, not tell their children. God's people have a requirement. The question, then for you and me, I hope that you are asking your parents lots of questions sit down and have some family devotions, probably around dinner time. Dad takes out the Bible and reads a portion of God's Word, maybe a chapter. There are a lot of things in the Bible that I need to slow down. I need to go research in other commentaries or other places. What has been said about these things? You too should be asking, Dad, Mom, what did that mean in there when it said this? We don't have pillars of stones piled up around us anymore that do that. But we have God's Word. The Spirit is poured out on you. And so you too can ask Mom and Dad. That's your responsibility. To ask Mom and Dad. To be curious about what you read in the Bible. Or tonight, prayer day. You hear the preaching. You 
go home and you say, now mom and dad, what did the minister mean by that? I didn't quite understand his point. And I pray that your parents are not afraid to do that. Or if you aren't asking questions, they ask you questions. So what stood out in the chapter tonight that we read? What do you wonder about? What can I explain more to you more? That's how we can see that in our lives. Our churches do that. We see ceremonies. Maybe you ask mom and dad. Mom and dad, I'm, I don't quite understand the, the pictures that are in the Lord's Supper. What do those mean? Why do you drink wine? Why do you eat a piece of bread? Mom or dad, what's the idea behind the minister sprinkling water? Ask, why don't we dunk them like we see other people do? Why do we do it when they're a baby instead of older? Those are memorials that we see in our churches too. Why do we do things a certain way? Ask them. Those are the important questions that we should be asking. And that way we learn more about our God and how he is good and he is faithful to us. Just as the young children of the Israelites. Now, I always wonder about that too where it says, until this day. Are they there still? Could I go and find them? No, that's not what it means. I've always wondered that. But the idea, or as a kid I was wondering, oh, does that mean I have to go find it now? No. No. Those stones were still there in the day that the writer wrote this book of the Bible. Those days are long gone. We can imagine some shepherd passing by or some careless child starting to slowly every time they walk past knocking them over. Maybe they're used to build a house. Maybe they were used for something else. But in the time of Israel, they knew not to remove those pillars of stones. They knew that they were there for a specific memorial. We can imagine when the Israelites were hauled away to Babylon, the land was overrun by heathens. They didn't know the significance of those piles of Rome, stones, and they used them for their homes and everything else. So we would not go there and find those same piles today. But when the author wrote this, they were still there. That's the idea there behind that phrase. So, like I said, hopefully in your lives you ask mom and dad questions too. What do you want to know about? What didn't you understand? And that's the way that God, one of the ways that God reveals himself to us today is through you asking questions, wanting to know more, being curious.